I have come tonight to bring our silence to an end. I bear a message of challenge, not self-congratulation. I want your attention, not your applause. I would never have asked to be HIV positive, but I believe that in all things there is a purpose, and I stand before you and before the nation gladly. At the peak of the HIV AIDS epidemic, when Mary Fisher gave her historical speech, A Whisper of AIDS, to the National Republic Convention, Houston Astrodome, Texas, in hopes of spreading awareness of the disease sweeping the nation. She spoke about the mass infection rates, the lack of awareness, and first and foremost, how she felt that none of the patients were victims, but rather people bound together by a single thing, and how they were no different than they were before. Mary Fisher had a short but powerful history with HIV AIDS. During her first marriage, she had contracted the disease from her first husband, having tested positive in 1991. Having been raised by politi politicians in the White House, she sucked out the attention of the Republican Party to make a national speech about the lack of awareness and fair treatment to those who lived with HIV Though and AIDS. Though I am white and a mother, I am one with a black infant struggling with tubes in a Philadelphia hospital. Though I am female and contracted this disease in marriage and enjoy the warm support of my family, I am one with the lonely gay man sheltering a flickering candle from the cold wind of his family's rejection. Throughout her speech, Mary Fisher infers that the recent issues of subjection towards gays and rejection and the lack of awareness of the cause was to blame for the 1.5 million people infected as of 1991. Her use of vocabulary aids her in her speech, using her speech to connect not only to the listeners in the audience, but to the millions of people inflicted around the world, and subsequently intercept their worries and rejections into her speech. She brings in the overwhelmingly large amount of rejection given not only to HIV patients, but gays as well, by saying, sheltering a flickering candle in the cold wind of his family's rejection, where the flickering candle is his ego or perhaps his humanity, and the cold wind is foremost the rejection his family gave him when they found out that he was gay and HIV positive. By referring to the child, however, she has made an emotional bond to all the parents of the sad fate of children around the world suffering from HIV AIDS, while making it fully aware to the audience and to the world that it was not just homosexuals, but yes, what Americans saw as average people living average lives, they could still contact the disease. No one was safe. We may take refuge in our stereotypes, but we cannot hide there long, because HIV asks only one thing of those it attacks. Are you human? And this is the right question. Are you human? Because people with HIV have not entered some alien state of being. They are human. They have not earned cruelty, and they do not deserve meanness. They don't benefit from being isolated or treated as outcasts. Each of them is exactly what God made, a person. Not evil, deserving of our judgment. Not victims, longing for our pity. People, ready for support and worthy of compassion. Possibly one of her most brilliant statements, Fisher asks the audience to use their common sense if HIV does not strike people solely on their humanity, or lack of thereof, then why do fellow humans do the same? What strikes people to think that HIV has changed them from anything less than human? What makes it so that after years of this epidemic being around, after science has proven otherwise, that HIV AIDS patients are anything less than the humans they truly and honestly are? It does not matter if they are gay, straight, black, or white. It matters just if they are human. And by being human, they do not deserve the privilege of subjection by the people around them. Now, it is an important aspect to remember that when the speech was given, HIV AIDS was only around for a mere eight to nine years. Once thought as GRID, gay-related immune deficiency, many people did not want to relate or react with people not only because of homophobia, but of a defined fear of contacting what was thought to be known as a singular virus spread by gays. 
Though it was quickly renamed AIDS and proven that it was passed through bodily fluids, people quickly associated it with gays and drug abusers instead of common day folk. This was a common stereotype until Mary Fisher came to the stage to speak. The face of a typical American girl, the beauty queen, whatever you saw in her, would change the fate than by those abandoned by stereotypes. With her words given, If not all of you have been so blessed, you are HIV positive, but dare not say it. You have lost loved ones, but you dared not whisper the word AIDS. You weep silently, you grieve alone. I have a message for you. It is not you who should feel shame, it is we. We who tolerate ignorance and practice prejudice. We who have taught you to fear. We must lift our shroud of silence, making it safe for you to reach out for compassion. In her speech, Mary Fisher recalls how her family had supported her with much gusto. But the reality remains that many families do not treat those with HIV with much humanity. By giving her story, she has shown that she has lived this life so strongly, so fiercely, while showing what true support from a family, from friends, from society can do to a person with this deficiency. In her own way, she had yet again connected to patients all around the world by saying, lift our shroud of silence. It is practically a metaphor to stop hiding under the shame in silence. She tells them it is now that they must stop being silent sufferers and live their life to the fullest, to embark on a lifestyle where it is safe to live normally and to love without fearing your disease may get to ruining your life. After giving her speech, Fisher was honored with the privilege of being one of America's 100 top speeches in the words of a century, the top 100 American speeches 1990 to 1999. Today, she works as a member of the United Na Nations AIDS program, where she travels frequently to assist children and adults with HIV AIDS. She has set up numerous donation campaigns, spoken as many awareness fests such as the one in Harvard University and has even set up a bracelet business to send the profit to the AIDS groups in Africa. She has turned 64 last year and continues to write books. She has written five and is in the process of writing a second memoir, which she claims I had to write because I didn't think I would live this long.